Welcome to the wonderful world of wine. We are your hosts, Mark Lindsay and Kim Simone, exploring all things wine with you. You can find us on Facebook at The Wonderful World of Wine. Hello again, everybody, and welcome to the wonderful world of wine. How are you today, Kim? I'm doing great, Mark. How about yourself? Everything is great. Another new year is here. Once again, we have a very special guest, Kim. We have Marley Bromhall from Iola Wines. How are you, Marley? Hey, Mark and Kim. I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. It's great to be here. Welcome to the show. We really appreciate hearing everything about you. We wanted our listeners to learn about your company and yourself. Can you please start out by giving a short intro on yourself and your company? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm Marilee Bramhall. I'm the founder of Iola Wines. And Iola Wines is focused on sourcing the best, most exciting, expressive wines that are naturally made from women winemakers in France. France and Italy. And we've been around for a few years now, but really starting to work on building and developing the business to, over the past year. It's exciting to be talking to y'all out on the other coast. I'm in Seattle. We always talk to people all over the country, but I feel like we get really excited for people who have been working in the wine business for a while and have been doing multiple things in the wine industry and then have sort of found this passion and have created a new company. And it's really exciting to see what people are doing with those special interests of theirs and how they are promoting wineries really from all over the world. It's always really exciting to get to talk to people who've kind of made their passions into their businesses. And this is something that we see an awful lot from people in the wine business. But you started in California. Is that correct? Well, I started here on the West Coast, yeah, working for um, a large wine company here, the largest wine company here in the state of Washington that also Washington. had some holdings in California. So I had the great good fortune to travel to Napa Valley quarterly for quite some time. And it was wonderful. I had such a great time at that point in my career. I really actually was looking for a way to move there. Never managed to make that happen, which is probably good because I probably wouldn't be involved with Iola Wines at this point if that had happened. Have you been in the wine industry for your whole career or is this like kind of a, a second phase for you? Well, it's funny. It was actually a first phase, then a pause because so I was in the wine business for just under a decade and then I left wine and my thought was, you know, okay, that chapter's closed. I'm moving on. But I love to tell people that um, wine does this thing where it kind of gets its hooks in you or it mm -hmm. gets in your blood. I guess it's like the mob, you know, like once you think you're out then <laughs> you're right back in or something like that. <laughs> that it's a lifelong um, commitment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, and so that's what happened to me. Basically, I I mean, in 2008 is when I, I started to get really curious about the old world. And that was also coincidentally the year that I left domestic wine. And I actually haven't I don't think I've bought even a bottle of domestic wine since 2008, just because I got into this place of deciding I really wanted to study the old world. So that's what I did. And then eventually it turned into a starting an import business in 2017. And it was a wholesale business for a few years and then took an abrupt right turn in um, 2020 as a result of the pandemic. Yeah, that's when you shifted everything to thinking about online, correct? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, what happened for me was as a small importer here in Seattle, I didn't have a license that allowed me to do anything but sell wholesale to small restaurants and very small retail. So uh, right before the pandemic, right before a lockdown happened, I had like six pallets of wine arrive. And then we went into lockdown. And, you know, it's funny at this point where we've sort of, you know, come out on the other side of, of the pandemic. And so it's easy, I think, I mean, certainly for me, so I'm guessing for other people as well, to forget what those early moments were like right after lockdown started when we really 
really had no idea what was going to happen. There was just such a sense of uncertainty about what the future held. And so, of course, at that point, you know, my small restaurant clients were, they were all saying, you know, don't be coming to to sell us wine. We're just not going to be doing that. We have no idea when. So, I mean, basically the short of it was I lost all of my clients, my customers in a day. And that was March 15th of 2020, like two days before I had done an, an event at a wine bar here in Seattle. And then, you know, two days later, all of a sudden I didn't, I didn't have any customers anymore. And I also had no legal way to sell the wine that I had just received from Europe. So it was a moment to switch things up, be creative, experiment with something new. So that's what I did. I really just turned it into a big experiment to see what would happen if I got the licensing, you know, built a goofy little website myself and started trying to sell direct to consumer. Wow, that is quite the pivot. (laughs) Yeah, it was, it was, um, I mean, things haven't changed hugely, but I, that point I used to say, you know, that I was the CEO, which meant the chief everything officer, because (laughs) really I did. I built the website. It was terrible. That was the first website Iola ever had. And it was really basic. Someone could order wine and, you know, a transaction, you know, transactions could happen, but it, it wasn't fabulous. It didn't do much. And then I, you know, I had to set up all the bookkeeping myself and learn about accounting and bookkeeping. And that was a kind of a new thing for me. So there was social media. I did all of that myself. So there was a lot for me to do. And then at the same time, just, you know, the process of selling wine and what that was like and selling during COVID was actually a really interesting experience. I find that, you know, so many people have difficult kind of, you know, in some cases, traumatic pandemic stories. And mine actually is really pretty great. I was felt very blessed about uh, how things went for me. I mean, I, I'm where I am now because of the need to figure out a way to sell wine when I could didn't have a way to. And then through the pandemic, I was delivering wine to people. So literally, I would stand on people's doorsteps delivering wine from Italy and France. And they would tell me about, you know, when they went to Tuscany or when yeah. they went to Bordeaux or when they went to Burgundy. And for them, it was a way to travel when they couldn't just sort of to relive those travel memories through a glass of wine. So it was really actually a really special experience for me. I have a lot of great memories of standing on people's doorsteps, masked and just Mm -hmm. listening to them um, talk about their lives. What a lovely way to frame it, too. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, the the story is just amazing. I mean, it's not only survival, but the background of what you sell and who you promote. It's really the whole thing Kim and I love about the wine world. You're focusing on the small production, but you're focusing also on women owned and women run businesses. And I saw a stat on your website about 80% of the wine purchased in the US is made by a woman. Did you use that research to kind of go the direction you went to? 80% up to, I mean, some say, some say 85% of of wine purchases are made by women. Yeah. But only 15% of the winemakers are women in the world, correct? Yeah, that is, that's the, I mean, there are some, it varies from, of course, from region to region. Um, I think in Champagne, it's about something like 25% of of wine growers are women. I think in California, it's something like 20%. So yeah, globally, the number that I've found is 15%. And, you know, that's just the number of producers. It's not, you know, we're not talking about the volume of wine produced by women. And I think if we looked at that number, it'd probably be significantly smaller than 15% of all wine produced. So yeah, it's definitely purpose-driven for me. And I, Mark, did you ask, did I use that information when I was sort of putting this business together? Yeah. Did you look at that data thinking there's a role out there I need to fill for these women purchasing wine? Oh, I wish I could say yes. And that I was that plan and thoughtful, but no, (laughs) I didn't. It was more, um, I'll just call it anecdotal evidence. How about that? It was more based on my experience being in the wine business. So my job was on the corporate side of the business. I did a lot of recruiting for winemaker positions, assistant winemakers, enologists, viticulturalists, cellar masters, you know, people that were hands-on with, and then a lot of leadership development with those people as well once they were hired. And I saw women, both internally and externally, uh, trying to get 
the winemaker positions, assistant winemaker positions, enologist positions, and I just didn't get them. Part of what was challenging as a woman to watch was seeing women inside the business trying to win these roles and not being selected and having the company select men from outside the business when there was an awesome candidate inside the company. They were being what I use the words passed over. And we didn't have a head winemaker who was a woman um, until toward the end of my tenure. It, she was in California, but she wasn't at a marquee location where there was going to be a lot of FaceTime for her. There, I mean, she was at a production oriented location and there wasn't any sort of visitor center there. There wasn't any of the the role where there's a bunch of star power involved or, mm-hmm. you know, f- you know, FaceTime or being the, the face of the brand. There just that didn't exist for her. And then in terms of women in senior leadership positions, we had one executive leader who was a woman. So there was that element for me. And then there was also the piece of traveling around wine country in France and Italy. And you take France, for example, you drive through wine country and you see a lot of père et fils. And and finally, I, you know, I just wanted to know where are the mère et fille? Where are the mother and daughter duos? It's all father and son everywhere. So there's my anecdotal evidence. That's what kind of fueled my desire to do this. So I was going to say that you also have this other prong, I guess you can say, of the mission of your company, which is not just to highlight female winemakers, but to highlight natural wine and organic and biodynamic practices, which we've talked a lot about on on our show. And I can imagine looking through how many women winemakers are then implementing those kinds of practices. Does that make for a really narrow group of uh, wines and people who you're talking to or enough to fill the portfolio? Well, um, the answer to your question is yes and yes. Yes, it really, I mean, just focusing on women producers eliminates so many possibilities, obviously, when we're talking about the stats that we talked right. about already. Certainly, that's going to mean that there's just fewer producers to select from. And then, he, yes, absolutely, when we put that extra a hurdle in place of um, you know what I call naturally made, then it is, yeah, it's even more difficult. Yes, there are enough wines to fill the portfolio, but it's a matter of doing a lot of research. And mm-hmm. I mean, for me, one of the things that it's important to me that that people understand about Iola wines is yes, it's absolutely about women and naturally made wines, but above all, it's about exceptional wine. It's about just wines that are alive and vibrant and have a sense of place. So they really take people somewhere when they start tasting them and, you know, spending time with them, they find them to be exceptional. So yeah, it's hard. And it's also really rewarding when I get to discover producers that they don't have a presence here in the U.S. at all, except for through Iola Wines. We have a a handful like that. And it's, it is really rewarding to find those exceptional wines. We come back time and again, I feel like, to this idea and this concept of not only is it about the quality of the wine in the glass, but also that story that's attached to it. And it sounds like that is what you're going for. So not only that story of who is making the wine, how are they making it, but that the quality is in the glass and that it's really showing this sense of individuality and sense of place, whether we call it terroir or whatnot, and that there is this story that goes along with the wine that adds just something to it and heightens that enjoyment of drinking that glass of wine. Absolutely. That's exactly, um, yeah, you hit the nail on the head. That's exactly what I'm going for is exceptional, vibrant. I mean, yeah, whether we call it terroir or, you know, whatever sense of place. Yeah, I'm trying to tick all those boxes. And like I said, it's really rewarding when I find a new producer who has that amazing story. And boy, let me tell you, there are so many of them that have amazing stories. They're just like all of us. We all have a story and their stories are really exciting. And it's such a privilege to get to tell these stories. And then on the flip side, when I'm presenting these wines to customers, whether it's in private masterclasses or just people that 
that buy from the website and then get in touch with me. It's so rewarding to hear uh, people enjoying the wines and mm. it's great both sides. And the funny thing is, is that the producers I work with, they all want to know who are the people drinking our wines? You know, can, what do you can tell us about them? Who oh, so it's the other here? side of it too. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's on both sides. Yes. I mean, I like to tell people that my role is just to be the link. I'm just the link between the producers in France and Italy and the people here in the U.S. that are enjoying the wines. Marley, one of the things I wanted to ask you to get your opinion on, you mentioned champagne and we talked about how women winemakers were not really getting the respect or the recognition they deserve. And way back, 1700s, 1800s, champagne houses were run by women, women owned and women run operation. What do you think happened over the years where it was acceptable way back like that and then it just kind of faded away? Well, I I mean, okay, so if you will indulge some wine history geeking out for a minute, I will tell you what my opinion is about that. First of all, I will say I have a point of view about champagne, which is this. I believe that and you know, this is just my opinion. This is nobody else's opinion. People can agree or disagree. But I strongly believe that champagne, the region and the wine is what it is today, largely because of the resilience and the innovation of women. Um, you talked about women run and women owned champagne houses way back when. So yeah, the first one was the Madame Veuve Clicquot. And that was around the turn of the, er, the early 1800s. I think she was married around the early 1800s, um, not for a very long time either. Her husband died at a very young age, about five years after they were married. So that put her in a position, a unique position, a very unique position. And that was to be a widow. And in France, because of the way the Napoleonic Code was written, and I think the Napoleonic Code came out in around 1805, restricted women from being able to own a business. They certainly couldn't have a bank account or anything like that without the express permission of either, you know, a father, a husband, you know, maybe a brother. So there had to be a man that was sort of signing off on this happening. The exception was for widows. Widows were not bound by those requirements. So if you look at all of that, you know, you know, looking back in history, the women owned, women run champagne houses, they were all widows for quite a long time. Champagne has a wonderful history of widows starting with the Madame Veuve Clicquot all the way up through today and then along the way. And, you know, you look at those, many of these widows have done very well, innovative. They've done some very innovative things, made some changes to and really important changes to how champagne is made and that completely and thoroughly impacted what I think the region and the beverage have become. So I'm, yeah, I I love the stories of the women of Champagne and I love that they they just keep going on. You know, nowadays, of course, you don't have to be a widow to um, to run your own champagne house. But I work with some incredible grower producers in Champagne that none of whom are widows, but they all have great stories as to how they got involved with with Champagne. Some of them are newer. Some of them are 10 and 11 generation Champagne growers. But each one has a great story. More and I get accepted. to go back in two weeks. <laughs> yeah. Kim's, Kim's big on the bubbly. Yeah. So. Oh, Kim, you and I are like-minded. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to be back there soon myself. When are you going? I will be there the week of February 5th. Ah, I'm going to be there the week before. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, we're going to just miss each other. I was going to see if you wanted to meet some producers Bummer. and have some bubbles. Oh, if I was there with you, I would. Next time. Next time. You're listening to The Wonderful World of Wine, and we are your hosts, Mark and Kim. You can find more information about Mark on his website, franklinliquors.com, and more information about myself and my classes at commonwealthwineschool.com. And today we have very special guest, Marilee Bromhall from Iona Wines. Her website is iolawines.com. 
and you can find her on Instagram at iola.wines. Welcome back to the wonderful world of wine. We are Kim and Mark, and we are here with Marilee Bromhall, and we've just been talking about women in winemaking, in champagne in particular. We talked a little bit about the pandemic and how... Uh, her business had to pivot and shift a bit when the uh, pandemic hit and she had to go from being a distributor to being an importer. And what kinds of things do you think the future will hold for your company? Are you expanding distribution? Are you expanding your portfolio? What is kind of taking up your time these days with the company? Oh, my goodness, everything, <laughs> anything and everything. It feels like it's all happening at once in um, a lot of different directions. So in terms of expansion, yes, we are currently working on um, a big project to move into several more states. So we'll be shipping to customers, which will mean that people can join our wine clubs in pretty much, I think we'll be in probably between 45 and 47 states. Oh, great. Um, yeah, which is really exciting. So yeah, we'll soon be in Massachusetts. I'm very excited for that. I've had a number of people that have been to Champagne and they have been to Champagne visiting women producers through a friend and colleague of mine who uh, does a wonderful, she just does incredible work in Champagne with taking visitors on excursions in Champagne, as well as teaching some wonderful classes and seminars and workshops in Paris. So through her, I've had a number of people from Massachusetts, actually, that have traveled with her contact me about getting into our sparkling wine club. And so far, we haven't been able to ship to Massachusetts. There are a few of them that are so patient and excited. They keep emailing me. So it's going to be really <laughs> exciting to be able to actually send wine to Massachusetts when this finally all comes together. Hopefully Yay. this spring is the plan. Yeah. We love our bubbles here. Oh, gosh. Yeah. I love them. Yeah, I love them too out here. Well, I love them wherever I am. <laughs> <laughs> Same. Yeah. I'm glad you told the listeners. I went on the site, beautiful site, beautiful wine list on there. And then I got the message that you couldn't ship the mass right now. So yeah. uh, once it's up, we'll uh, go back on there and hope our listeners will look at the site at that time and get some things delivered to them as well. I have to ask you, one of the things that's really trending in the wine world is women celebrities who have their own brand, big brands. They're not really winemakers. They're not winery owners, most of them. They just kind of put their names on label. What's your thoughts on, is this a good thing for wine or is it a good thing for women in wine for this to be happening at the level it is and how people are seeing these wines? That's an interesting question, Mark. You know, and I will tell you, I really haven't thought about it in that context before. So that's an intriguing question. I mean, I guess it's tricky because my immediate response would be, well, if women celebrities are putting their names on these, you know, they're creating brands. If by creating those brands, it, the result is that they're bringing more women into the world of wine, then I definitely see that as a good thing because that's a big thing that I'm working toward is I like to say I'm trying to democratize wine so that it's, you know, because for so long it's been, you know, kind of certainly male oriented and, and white male oriented. So it, it's time to kind of open the doors or set more places at the table or whatever, you know, metaphor for is the most fitting. If what they're doing is bringing more women into the world of wine and making more women feel like they belong in the world of wine, that, I mean, one of the things I see often when I'm doing classes is if I have a class that's um, men and women, one of the things I'll often do if, if I'm doing, let's say, for example, a champagne class, I will ask if there's anybody that would like to open a bottle of champagne. You know, we taste several champagnes for the evening. So it's an opportunity for a lot of people to, to and then I tell, you know, teach them what's here are the proper ways to open a bottle of champagne, blah, 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 you know, all the stuff that we people in the trade have been taught for years. And what's interesting is how often it's always men that volunteer to do that. Women don't volunteer. And, you know, finally, what I realized is, wow, they aren't volunteering because this is so inherent that women do don't feel like it's their place to do that. And they, so women, you know, if you go to a restaurant, a wine list is given to a man. If you are having people over for dinner, it's usually a man that's opening the wine, whether it's still or sparkling. So it seems like, I mean, my observation in, in these settings has been that basically it's so, um, like I said, inherent that, that this is something that men do. It's not something that women do. It's really fun to get women up there 
trying to open a bottle of champagne and finding that, wow, I can do this. I've never done this before. And I mean, I've had women, I don't know, they're probably 70 years old and they'd never opened a bottle of champagne and did it for the first time at a class with me. And it's, there's something that's empowering about that. There's also, you know, plenty of empowering elements when it comes to just having clarity about the kind of wine that they enjoy that, you know, they go away from a class yeah. knowing how to articulate what it is they like and what it is they want and how to um, articulate kind of the opposite of that, what they don't particularly care for. I guess the answer to your question, Mark, is I guess I have kind of mixed feelings about it because it's wonderful if it's bringing women into the world of wine. But on the flip side, I don't know who they're employing to make the wine. I don't know how they're making the wine. It's probably, you know, I'm assuming that they're doing really high volume because they're trying to capitalize on their name. So yeah, I mean, and And those aren't things that I'm a big proponent of. I'm not a big proponent of high volume stuff or, um, and of course I'm, I'm all about seeing women as wine growers. So yeah. That's exactly where I was hoping you would go because with so many women purchasing wine, consuming wine, and it is a good thing that they're seeing these celebrities put out the wines, I feel, but they're also probably seeing the wrong type of wines, I feel. If, say, Taylor Swift popped open one of your champagne bottles, I would say, wow, that is a great thing for the wine industry because she's promoting something small. Yeah. But I just feel it's a movement that's just supporting more of the bigger brands. It's a good thing more women are drawn to it, but I think women are already drawn to it. So mm-hmm. it's kind of confusing for me. So uh, I'm just... I was happy to hear your side of it as a wine seller and buyer and Mm -hmm. in the field. So my questions go off a lot. (laughs) (laughs) That's because you're the creative one, Mark. (laughs) Yeah, no, I don't know about that, but it's just things, I I just think of these things and it, it, at times it bugs me. I know you have such a battle going on and Kim and I fight this fight too, where we want people to explore other things out there and you're putting them in the people's hands and, and meeting these people and bringing them into the country for them. And it's a fight. And I'm sure you're seeing it every day. All the time. Yeah. I mean, it's, a big challenge to try to get people to not rely on the grocery store for their wine purchases. And I just feel like there's so many reasons to avoid buying wine in the grocery store. I mean, most of that wine is it's conventional high volume. You don't know what's in the wine. There's probably loads of additives in those wines. Most of the time, there isn't someone staffed there who can help answer questions. People are just sort of on their own in the wine aisle. And, you know, it might as well be the bread aisle or the dairy aisle or the chip aisle or whatever. So I don't know. I'm yeah, like you, I'm a big believer in people getting the chance to experiment. And that's another thing that's pretty tough to get in the grocery store selection. You're kind of getting the same thing from just a bunch of different producers in a, in a bunch of different regions, but the same grapes are showing up. You're probably not getting a lot of um, native Italian grapes that you maybe haven't heard of or more naturally made or more biodynamic wines or organic wines. Those are things that don't really show up in the grocery store as much. Cool stuff. The Mm -hmm. cool stuff that we all like. (laughs) Yeah, right. (laughs) But it's things with interest and something different to them that, again, kind of comes back to this whole story aspect of it. It's like, well, this is, you know, made by somebody who send an email to and they could write you back because the production generally on these things tends to be, you know, a little bit smaller and the producers are just more than happy to talk to the consumers. And I loved that story that you told earlier about the producers and the growers they want to know who's buying their wines, what is going on with them and what's in their mind when they pick up their bottles. So I really like that idea of kind of the story going back and forth. Mm-hmm. It, and that's what it is. Yep. All I am is just the conduit. And now that Kim mentioned stories, Marley, I, I have to ask you, what is the meaning of Iola? Oh, yeah. Uh, that's a story I love to tell. Um, Iola was my grandmother. She was just uh, someone who she had a big influence on my world. And I was lucky to have her for a really long time. People don't have a grandmother as long as as I did. And she absolutely loved to celebrate. She loved to party. She loved to be with people, um, just loved people, loved to cook. She was an incredible cook. I mean, I come from a farming family from southeastern Washington. So the world of agriculture is really present for me. I grew up working on our family farm and my grandmother was born on an orchard in 1920 and 
then married, obviously married a farmer, my grandfather, you know, she worked on the family farm too, in a, in a sense. I mean, she like during harvest, she fed the entire harvest crew. I mean, one year she made a different pie every day for a month during harvest. She could cook and bake like nobody's business. And um, she did not, she wasn't a, really a big wine drinker. Um, she Gin was her drink. And I love to tell people that my grandmother is the person that taught me to drink gin. <laughs> I want to be that kind of grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is something to aspire to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I don't have kids. So um, this was the baby that I got to name af after my grandmother. So that's the story of Viola. That's a great story. You have to import some Italian gin now or something into the portfolio. Oh, gosh. Yeah, I would love to do that. Yep. Be fun. I was reading that one of the things you look at when you're selecting someone to work with is that they have to have... Uh, made their wines with indigenous yeast. Is that it's still something that is one of your go tos when you're looking at a producer? Well, I, it's not a requirement, but it's always something I'm looking for. I mean, I definitely have a bias to toward low intervention wines. So the least intervention, you know, possible is usually what I'm after. But at the same time, the wines have to be clean and delicious, you know, no off elements to them. So yeah, I mean, I, I have a preference for wines that are vinified with uh, indigenous yeast, but it's not a hard and fast requirement because one thing I've learned is that there's no purity out there. You know, there's no, it's very unusual to find the ideal situation. There's always a tweak or an element of it that's different or um, unique. So what I've learned is that I, ha I just take each story as it comes and look at, okay, well, does it meet our requirement of um, naturally made? So are they, how are they farming? Are they farming responsibly and conscientiously? Are they being very mindful about their use of chemicals, meaning they're either not using them at all, or they're only using them, you know, in situations where they have to in order to save their crop that year? Most of the producers, I actually, I mean, I can't, there, I mean, I have the the stories of people from the 2021 vintage that was so dreadful in France, especially the northern part of France. A producer in Champagne lost her entire crop that year because she was in organic conversion at that time. She's completed that now, but as her and she, you know, stopped using any chemicals so long ago, and all of that rot before harvest resulted in absolute loss that year, complete. And then producer I worked with in Chablis, she lost 75% of her crop. Now she's not certified organic, but she has made her own commitment to the avoidance of chemicals. And as a result, she lost her crop that year. So those are yeah. the stories. I mean, people don't hear those type of stories when they're looking at their wine shelves or their wine lists. How do you work to keep getting that story out to people? Like they're looking at your wines. How do they get that information from you that this is what you, who you're supporting? This is what they're fighting. This is how they're treating their vines. This is, how, how do you do that? The biggest way I do it is through my newsletter, honestly, because the newsletter is the, is the big way that I get to tell producer stories. But it's also like getting to talk to you today is a great example of it. I mean, it's wonderful that you've been so gracious to have me on as a guest today so that I get the chance to tell the stories because the stories are incredible. I'm, can I tell one more? Absolutely. We love stories. Okay. So there's a producer that I work with in Piemonte and she's up in Alto Piemonte in Boca. So you know, it's not the Longue. It's Nebbiolo, but it's not the Longue. It's Nabarolo and Barbaresco that most people that love Nebbiolo know those regions. She's in Boca, which is much less well known, but exciting because of the fact that it's volcanic soil up there. So it's a different experience of Nebbiolo. I mean, I love this woman for many, many reasons. Um, she's very, very, humble and modest and self-effacing. And she actually joined the, she took over the reins of the family vineyard a little over 10 years ago. She had been in a five generation law practice with her dad. She was very close to her father. And when he died, she had to make a decision between the law practice and the vines. And she chose the vines, thankfully. Her first year hired a consulting agronomist to help her with her vines and under, you know, learning, learning, learning. And then she also had a consulting enologist to help her in the cellar. And after the, the first year, she told her consulting agronomist that what she really wanted to do was convert to organic 
viticulture. And he told her that would be the stupidest thing that she could ever do. It would be just an enormous mistake. And she thanked him for his point of view and terminated her relationship with him and proceeded to convert to organic viticulture. And now she's in a study with UNESCO on how to increase butterfly habitat in the vineyard. Cool. Wow. And what's the producer name? It's um, Poderi Ivaloni. Yeah. So you'll see a a few of her wines on our website. In fact, um, she does not produce tons and tons of wine. It's about 12,000 bottles a year. I think what's going to happen is more and more people are going to discover her because she's really fabulous. And um, she's getting some great scores from, I'm not a big fan of scores, but consumers find them helpful, I guess. But she's getting some wonderful scores uh, wonderful reviews of her wine. So it's going to um, soon become hard to get her wines. That's my forecast for what's going to happen with her. What a wonderful sure. success yeah. story for her. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure yeah. she's not making a lot of money either. She's just doing it for the passion and the the memory Tradition, of the family. And yeah, yeah. And the family connection. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, they do. The other thing she does that I love is because of where she is, you know, she's got a lot of opportunity to capture solar energy. So she do that. And then whatever they aren't able to use at the winery, they just give it to the village. Cool. Wow, that's great. Yeah. Those are the stories we love, Marley. That's mm-hmm. that's amazing. The people that, you know, that's what the wine world needs to hear. Stories like that, people out there, what they're doing, uh, regions like that, that they never explore. So we mm-hmm. appreciate that. Yeah. And that's one where, like, I think I just tend to root for the underdog. This is sort of Nebbiolo as the underdog. You know, Nebbiolo in the Longue is so well known and celebrated, but you get outside of there and there's some incredible Nebbiolo to be found in Valtellina and um, in Alto Piemonte up there. So yeah, I like to try to get people to experience something that they haven't necessarily had before. Yeah. We're Third. big Italian wine geeks too, exploring things from all over. And oh, I, I think I shock yeah. a lot of customers when they come in and they ask for uh, Barolo or something. Oh, how about this from here and here? And they, I didn't know they made Nebbiolo there. Or, so, nice. Yes. I love that. I end yeah, up that's, drinking that's a lot. That's kind of, of our thing. <laughs> Marley, we want to thank you for being a guest today. And we hope our listeners go to your website, iolawines.com, and read your story, look at your wines. And soon they are coming to Mass. So uh, please, listeners, check it out. And it's just a beautiful story, beautiful website, and great wines. We're big Italian and French fans here on the show. So uh, thank you very much for all your time. It's been really a pleasure to be here with both of you. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us today on The Wonderful World of Wine. We've been your hosts, Mark Lindsay and Kim Simone. Today's special guest was Marley Bramhall from iolawines.com. If you want more information about Kim, please go to her website at commonwealthwineschool.com. For more information about myself, please go to franklinlickers.com. Our program is supported by Franklin Public Radio. You can find our past episodes on SoundCloud and iTunes, and you can send all questions and comments to us on Facebook at The Wonderful World of Wine. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.